Hello, this is Metal Savage, and I'm here today to review for you some $100 bookshelf monitors. Today, we are going to be taking a look at the PreSonus Ares E3.5 and the Maki CR3X. Each cost $100. They enter the ring. Which one leaves? Uh, Sorry about that, everybody. That was my cousin. He's from uh, over in England or Australia. I don't know. Whichever one seems to make the most sense for that accent that he has, that he has, not me, because that definitely wasn't me, even though I still think I'm wearing the same shirt. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm going to review the Ares 3.5 from PreSonus as well as the CR3X from Mackie. These are both $100 per pair studio bookshelf monitors and the idea is that you can get you know powered little bookshelf monitors to mix and master some music of your own if you would like to for a very very budget price turns out that neither one of them are really that good and uh when i say not that good i mean pretty much abysmal as they are but i do have some suggestions on how to make the most of them if you are seriously hard limited to that budget of 100 dollars. and with all of that said this video is going to focus, as all my other videos do, on the objective data. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about frou-frou fluff and buzzwords and keywords that people like to use to sell products because that's not why I'm here. I'm here to provide you with hard facts, though I will talk about how what I heard relates to the data and we will spend some time going over some of the uh, issues that I found in these speakers and maybe ways that you can help mitigate those issues and get the most out of your budget if these are the two items that you're looking at purchasing. Before I go any further, if you're not familiar with what the data means and you're curious about how to interpret it, I have a series of videos explaining what the data is and how to interpret it, including some examples to walk you through them. Just click the link in the card here. It'll take you to that playlist and you can go check them out. The first speaker we're going to start out with is the PreSonus Aries E3.5. We are at my website right now. I'm going to scroll down and let's see here. We'll look at a couple pictures. So the front, you got a volume knob, you've got an auxiliary input, you've got a headphone output, you've got a power switch. This is the powered speaker, and then it provides you with a line out via speaker cables to the secondary speaker, which is more of a passive speaker. And you can see those outputs on the back. I'll blow this up a little bit more so you can see better. We can see the input takes RCA unbalanced and TRS one quarter inch jack balanced. And then it also has some tuning controls. It has a high frequency and low frequency shelf that I did play around with. And we'll talk about that toward the end of this review. And as I said, you've got the outputs going to the other passive speaker. The test data you're about to see was all taken with my Klippel near field scanner. And if you want to know a little bit more about what that device is, you can click this link right here, watch the video. And it is a discussion that I had with one of their designers. It's chock full of information about the near field scanner, but to sum it up, what it allows you to do is it allows you to measure a speaker without the room influence, which is to say it is an anechoic measurement. And it allows you to do so in a standard room. In my case, it's a garage. All of this testing is based off the CTA 2034 standard. And then I do some additional testing on my own. And we're going to walk through this pretty quickly. As I said, make sure you click the card up here if you want to know more about what these measurements mean. Starting out with the on-axis response in black, we can see that this speaker mostly has a very V curved or smiley face type curve to it. It is not flat by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, the mid range is down about six, maybe seven dB compared to the lowest base and the treble region. So right through here, you've got a huge scoop through the mid range, which is really going to mess with vocals. If you're mixing and mastering on a speaker, you definitely do not want the response to look like this because you want a neutral speaker. That just seems like common sense. If you get a colored speaker, then that means that you're going to maybe overcorrect or undercorrect some things based on what you're hearing. And when other people are listening to whatever you've produced or made, it's not going to sound right to them. And then if we look at the sound power and the early reflections, we can see there are a few resonances that show up here. Uh, this strong resonance right here, because this is a ported woofer and the enclosure, in my opinion, is just way too small for this, for this speaker uh, to be ported. And this results in a very peaky, boomy bass that just sounds horrible. And then you've got some, you know, resonance right here. I believe that is due to some kind of standing wave in the enclosure, because in fact, when I sealed up the, the port, 
um, this resonance was still there, although it was kind of uh, shaped a little bit differently, but it was still there. So I'm thinking the port is just leaking some kind of internal resonance, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, realistically, it doesn't matter what's causing it. The fact is that it is a strong resonance and the uh, one to two kilohertz region, and it just does not sound good. And then the high frequency, it's got some issues as well. So overall, this just is not a good performing speaker in terms of objective data. And certainly the objective data matches what I heard. Uh, if we go and look at the directivity response where you want just a smooth trend line, we can see that this speaker is very problematic, especially in this one to two kilohertz region again, and doesn't do a great job mating to the tweeter, although it's not terrible. Uh, the tweeter is pretty much omnidirectional out to about 16, 15 kilohertz or so, which, you know, is, is maybe okay, but the problem is that you've got a mismatch as the woofer starts to become more narrow in front of the speaker and there's a directivity mismatch between the tweeter and the mid woofer, mid range, if you wanna call it that. This is similar to what we saw before. I just took the on axis response only and gave you a plus minus area. So the gray is plus or minus one and a half dB compared to the mean. And the blue is the plus minus three dB window compared to the mean. And we can see just again, this is a very non-linear speaker. The distortion at 96 dB, which is louder than I think most people are gonna be listening to in the near field, is quite high and i think this just tells you right off the bat that you know this speaker is not intended to be listened to loudly this is some compression testing that i do and it's just a quick series of testing to see what the frequency response is like as you increase the volume and what this is telling me is there is some hard limiting going on when you get above 86 db uh, for this speaker and that's obvious because this blue line is dipped way below this neutral zero line and that tells me that there's about 2 dB to 1 dB of compression or limiting through the mid-range. So this is not a speaker, again, that is intended to be listened to loudly. There's a lot of distortion in the low bass region, which we're seeing show up as enhancement down here. So you're going to want to run a subwoofer or run a high-pass filter on these speakers to keep from a lot of low-frequency distortion. But again, this really shouldn't be a surprise if you're listening to a small speaker. Long-term compression, which is just to say the longer you listen to the speaker, how does the frequency response change? Well, it mainly changes in this one to two kilohertz area, and you're losing as much as a dB after about four minutes at 86 decibels. So the frequency response is changing. If you're thinking that you're listening to these and some, something sounds different as you've gone on and listened to them for a while, and you're thinking, well, maybe my ears are just fatiguing, it could be that, but it could also be that the actual frequency response of these speakers is changing. And then if you go up to 96 dB, which is louder than I think anybody is going to listen to these speakers, you can see that the compression and the enhancement distortion effects are really taking over um, within just a couple minutes. So I keep saying this, they are not intended to be listened to loudly. Uh, let's go through here. So one thing I'd done was I played around with the filters on the back, the little tonality knobs, and I tried to get it to where it sounded the best, but I also sealed up the port so you know it wouldn't have any boomy bass and i think that helped i got a more neutral response doing that which you can see here where the on axis response is certainly not nearly as dipped through the mid-range but there's only so much i can do through this one to four kilohertz region because the shelving seems to only really affect the highest of the high frequencies um so you know bringing the high frequencies down 6 db didn't do a whole lot boosting the low frequency by about plus 3 db you know it gave the overall tonality a uh, better shape but it didn't really it didn't fix all the problems that's that's the best way to put it now if you have the ability to run dsp so you've got dsp built into your computer or you've got mini dsp that you can purchase which is like 99 bucks i think these days i would recommend doing that because with with that you can equalize the speaker to sound better it's not going to sound perfect but it will sound a lot better and i think it will help you you know make the most of this hundred dollars that you spent and i would highly encourage you do that or maybe just save up that money and get you something that's a little bit better and hopefully over time i'll find something that's you know a much better product for the 100 dollars region or the 200 dollars region but so far this is all i've got so you are welcome to go to my website and check out these dsp suggestions now we're going to look at the mackie cr3x and see on the front we've got a three inch woofer and a three quarter inch tweeter and a little volume knob right here and this right here is a headphone port. On the back, you've got TRS inputs as well as RCA inputs. And then you've got the little 1 8 inch auxiliary input to go on the back. 
And as you can see, the speaker is powered right here, but it also sends power to the more passive speaker right here. And then we've got the on off switch. Now, the one thing to note is that this speaker does not have any tonality adjustments like the PreSonus does. Moving on to look at the Spinorama data, we can see that we still have a boosted low end, but the overall on axis response here is better, I guess. You know, it's, it's not more linear. Uh, because you've got some of these guys going on, but it isn't as V-curved as the PreSonus is. But again, you've got this boosted bass because they try to port a little speaker like this, and I wish companies would just stop porting bookshelf speakers. Stop it. We're going to run subwoofers. And doing this obviously doesn't help. It just makes it sound like junk. So I don't know. Unless you're just impressed by a lot of resonant booming and high-frequency stuff, <sighs> These speakers are just very disappointing. This again is just kind of a window to provide you with the linearity. And as I said already, the linearity on axis is better than the PreSonus. The distortion on the Mackie is better, uh, at least through the majority of the mid range. And then if we go up to the 96 dB, we can see that it is still better, you know, through the mid range, it's below 3% THD, which is good. Uh, I don't think that you're gonna necessarily have any problems out of this speaker in terms of, you know, louder levels, but Again, you're probably not going to be listening to these too loud because they're going to be in the near field, which is what they're designed for, like computer system speakers. You, these are not recommended to buy for home theater or, you know, rocking out in the living room. That's just not at all what their purpose is built for. Now we're going to look at the compression. This is just instantaneous compression. And what we can see here is similar to that of the PreSonus where at 86 dB, it's, it's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. But once you get past that and go to the 96 dB, there's a whole, whole lot of limiting going on with these speakers. Again, not intended to be listened to loudly. And long-term compression test for this speaker is better than it was with the PreSonus at both volume levels, so 86 dB and 96 dB. And then for a final comparison, this is what we've got. The, let's see, the black line is the PreSonus at just default with me not adjusting any of the little volume gain knob things on the back. And then the blue knob is the Mackie and I line them up through the mid range because that's important to me, you know, as far as trying to mix things, you want to know what the mid range is doing. So I line them up there. And as you can see, the PreSonus is about three to five dB higher in output in the treble region, which is not good. You really do want a neutral speaker for mixing. And I would not recommend the PreSonus based on this alone. However, if you stuff the port of the PreSonus and then you do some of the tonality adjustments that I recommended, you get this in green, where again, the Mackie is in blue. And you can see that actually the Mackie still, in my opinion, looks better because it's, it's without, you know, significant peaking through here. The low frequency end on the Mackie is more, more boomy, but that's because I just don't have a measurement with me plugging the port. So that explains the difference here. And if I had plugged the port, you probably would have gotten a smoother uh, response right in the low region. And in that case, yeah, I would still recommend the Mackie. So let's talk about the end results. Both speakers for monitoring are not ideal. Neither one of them have any sort of neutral response. The PreSonus does have the little tonality adjustments on the back of it that you can make tweaks to. But even once you do that, it's still not without pretty significant problems. I think what I would recommend no matter what is with either speaker, plug the port, stuff it with a t-shirt, stuff it with a towel, do something. These manufacturers are out there and they're putting ports in speakers. I think it's just to trick people like you, you know, people who may not know better. And I don't mean that to mean it be offensive. I'm just speaking off of my experience here to people who see a speaker with a port and assume that, oh, it's going to get low bass. And it doesn't get low bass, it just gets really resonant, maybe punchy bass at a couple frequencies, but that's really it. I'm gonna make a plea to manufacturers to stop producing ported speakers unless you do it with a good design. Don't just give me a port that's a one hit wonder that peaks at 80 hertz or 100 hertz and then falls off rapidly below that. Just give me a sealed speaker and let me use the subwoofer for it. Between these two, however, if you're strictly limited on a budget of $100 and, and these really aren't your only options, I would recommend to go with the Mackie because it's just a more neutral speaker overall. It's not perfectly neutral. Uh, in fact, it's still pretty far away from that, but I think it's the better option of the two, even with the PreSonus having those adjustments on the back. 
think the one thing about the PreSonus having those adjustments is that you can put it near a wall, I mean, stuff the port still, but you can put it near a wall and you can turn the little base knob down to get the bloated base from putting it near a wall. You can bring that back down. With either speaker, I would recommend you turn these speakers off axis. And if you haven't watched my other videos, I cover that in great detail, but just to quickly remind some of you or to tell you if you haven't seen it, on axis would be when the speaker is pointed directly toward you like this. And off axis will be when the speaker is pointed away from you like that. So I would recommend that you turn the speakers off axis, maybe angle them at about 30 to 40 degrees away from you. And I think that's probably more ideal when you put them on, you know, a, a desktop or something like that. You don't have to turn them inward. You can just face them outward a little bit and that will take that treble and it will smooth it down a little bit and make it a more neutral sounding speaker. And to give you an example of what I mean, this is the Mackie's SPL, the frequency response at different horizontal angles. So as you turn the speaker like directly on axis to the side, the on axis line is the dark red. And then each of these other colored lines match up with the angle that you would turn the speaker off axis. And what I'm seeing generally is that if you get to this yellow or this green, that makes the response more neutral in the treble. I mean, it's still got resonances, but it's more neutral and it's not as lifted in the top end. And I think that's going to help out to kind of tame the high frequency. And then if you seal up the port on the Mackie, it will drop this low frequency down some to make it not so peaky, not so resonant. And then you'll have an overall better speaker. So my final suggestion is I would purchase the Mackie. I would stuff the port and I would turn them off axis away from you. Make sure that you put the tweeter level with your ear though, because if you don't, you'll get something crazy like this where, you know, the ideal line is through here and the further above and below the speaker you go, the more deviation you get through that crossover region and the more issues you hear. And that ends this video. I hope you guys learned something and I hope you appreciate the time I took to present you with the data. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to ask in the comments below. And if you do plan on purchasing one of these speakers, if you don't mind, it would be a great help and it would be much appreciated if you would do so using my affiliate link, which I'll drop in the description below, or you can find on my website in the review page itself. It helps me with a very, very small commission, but at no additional cost to you. It doesn't cost you a single dime more to order it through my affiliate link, but it helps me keep this site going. And over time helps me pay off some of these things that I have to pay for in order to provide you with this data. So for me, Aaron and my buddy, Metal Savage, I'll talk to y'all later. Peace.